we are excited to be in D.C. As, as most could uh, attest to that are also in this tournament, it's an incredible honor uh, to play in the Sweet 16. And we got a great feel for it last year in Atlanta. And to be able to come to D.C., to be able to play in this building, to be able to play in this tournament, in the history of this tournament, and in such a great city for basketball like this uh, is exciting. We got in yesterday. We practiced yesterday afternoon. And uh, since then, it's just been a matter of these guys getting acclimated to D.C. and uh, watching a lot of tape, doing some walkthroughs, staying off their feet, enjoying themselves, and, and uh, getting ready to come over here today. But it's a uh, uh, fantastic regional, to, and, and to be a part of this with Syracuse, with Marquette, with Miami uh, is a big, big deal for us. And uh, we expect to have a lot of fans here, as I'm sure all the other three schools do. And uh, we hope to play our best tomorrow night. All right, again, uh, raise your hand. A microphone will be brought to you. Please state your name and your affiliation, and we'll start right down here in the front. Let's go. You've been asked this before, but I'll ask it again. What, what do you remember about the first time you saw Victor Oladipo, and what were the circumstances? Was, was he in eighth grade? or? No, I don't think it was that young. It was in his – it was uh, – I think it was probably the ninth grade year, and, and DeMatha would always have so many players in their workouts that, that were young and old because it's such a great program. And the thing that just stood out to me about him was the, the first thing about his intangibles was his eye contact. I mean, this is, a, this is somebody that looked his coaches in the eye, looked his teammates in the eye, and I know that sounds like a simple thing, but in this day and age, it's not. That's a big deal. And, and so you just stood out early on that he was aware that he, that, he, that he had very good self-awareness. But then when you would see him play, I think the thing to me was just the burst of athleticism, you know, what he was like around the rim. And then just this innate desire, to me, to just be a great defender, especially on the ball, and how he could spread out with these long arms and quick feet and get his nose down in the player's chest and, and, and not hop and, and, and not get beat off the dribble but really, really work at defense. So the athleticism and the desire to defend were the, were the first things that really stood out to me. And then just watching him from a distance and just watching how he was with his teammates, his coaches, that eye contact again, that, you know, his personality starting to show. And then when you start to get to know him, I mean, then you just see what everybody else sees. And uh, the other thing that, that, that always stood out to me, not necessarily the first time, but that as good as he was with his teammates, he was very, very comfortable with his coaches you know, no matter what their age was. And he was comfortable in those groups. I really saw that in the summertime when he would be with his team takeover program. And Keith and Kenny, I mean, he, he, was, just, he was just one of the guys. It wasn't here's the coaches, here's the players. I mean, he was mixed in all of that. And, again, that sounds simple, but it's not. That, that to me, is a big deal because that shows that a guy is, really wants to absorb things. Right, we're going to start over there to our right-hand side, Coach. Bill Spaulding, WAR Radio in Syracuse. You have some familiarity coaching against Jim Beheim's zone with Marquette. How does that help you in preparation, and, and what kind of challenge is going up against that zone? Well, the challenge, it, the challenge never ceases. I mean, it's, it's always great because he recruits, in my mind, to that defense. He's got great length. There's great foot speed. They cover ground in a, in a quick period of time. They move on the pass, not the catch. Uh, there's always shot blockers that are not only in the middle but come from the wings, the long arm, guard, long arm guards always create an issue. Uh, at Marquette, we didn't necessarily have the ability to score in the low post that, that, that maybe we have now. So it was a little bit different attack. And, uh, and we had very good guards. We had people like Jarrell McNeil, Wes Matthews, you know, Dominic James, Lazar Hayward, people like that that could make plays, but we didn't necessarily have the low post ability. So it, it, it allows you to be a little bit more creative when you have that. I, I don't think you can look at that zone and think you're going to beat it any one way. But I also know that you can't look at that zone and think that you're going to stand around and pass the ball on the perimeter either. That is a recipe for defeat. And so we've got to be really, we've got to be really solid with what we do. We've got to be assertive and aggressive, and we've got to have uh, uh, a lot of ability to adjust and change against it. Coach, we'll go right down here in the front, and then we'll go to the middle row. Uh, Coach, Ken Bykoff, Inside Indiana. I know that you guys have played a lot of different styles this year. Does Syracuse remind you of any team or parts of Syracuse remind you of other teams that you've played? Not really. Not really. The, the, the one team that plays uh, a very good zone in our league would be Northwestern. And, and the, the reference points we've given, there's always certain characteristics of certain players that you try to reference with them this time of year. 
the thing they do on offense uh, that they get, in my mind, very little credit for is how well they screen. And there's an area where, like, Northwestern's guards and forwards are as good as screeners as there are in our league, I think. But there's really nobody we've played, nobody that these kids have played, that you can look at and say, yeah, we went through 40 minutes of this. There's not. And, and, uh, but that's the beauty of the tournament. In the middle, to hoops. Hey, Tom, how are you? Good. Uh, difference philosophically between your league and the Big East. Did, was, was there a philosophical change when you came to the... Not for me. Not for me. We, we, we knew what, what we liked doing in the Big East and, and the kind of players that we like to recruit, the versatility, the athleticism, I think, if anything. You know, we've tried to really put even more of a premium on shooting uh, in the Big Ten, but but none of us ever came in with a mindset that we're just going to recruit to the standard prototype uh, Big Ten team because that's that, that wasn't relevant for us at the beginning. You know, it was more relevant, let's go get length, athleticism, versatility, multidimensional players, athletes, and at the same time, because we're at Indiana, let's try to increase the skill level every chance we get. And I think that's exactly what we've tried to do. So... Now, with that being said, do we have the length and, and athleticism that, that a team like this has? No, we don't, and, and very few do. So you've got you've to make sure that your spacing is right, your screening is right, your posts are right, you know, where you're attacking from, all those different things. But uh, the, the, the similarities are, I think, in the two leagues, that every night you're going to play against great coaches, you're going to play against star players, and you're going to play against really sound, deep teams. And deep may mean eight seven or eight, but they're deep enough. And I think that's what kind of prepares you or you hope prepares you to get into a point like this. Right down here in the front. Yeah. Top. Rick Bozich, WDRB. Um, w Victor came in with Will, and, and Will and Victor both seem to play with an edge, uh, especially Will. What, what's the value of that edge to you as a coach? How, how do you employ it? It's like having an extra player on the floor because, because when you get – when, when you get entitled and out, enabled uh, type of guys, they're not going to go the extra mile. They'll, they'll get by for a while on talent, and they'll get things done for you, but, but they're not going to win big for you. I mean, there's got to be intangibles. And the edge, you know, all those things I talk about, you know, the, to me that are big, the eye contact, the awareness, the absorbing, all those things are really huge. But you've got to have, you know, for lack of a better phrase, you've got to have a real chip on your shoulder. And, and uh, there's nothing wrong with that. That, that, that's that, that, that there, there's there's many a great player uh, that have made many a great team that started out with that chip. The ones that lost it didn't stay great. The ones that built on it, you know, end up legendary. And and it's no different in college. I mean, you've got to have that. And I think Victor and will have that because it was never about just what they did when everybody was looking or when everybody had to be there. It was always about what they did when nobody was looking or when nobody had to be there. It's the extra work. And Jordan Hulls came in the same way. That's why he's the all-time leader in games played at this point or tied for it at this point, whatever it is. I mean, it's – and I don't know if anybody would have seen that coming four years ago. And it, but there's nothing wrong with having that edge as long as it's channeled the right way. And every once in a while, will it, will it get overstepped? Yeah. But you know what? So what? You've got to have guys that, 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 that they're not afraid of the big moments because they practiced and prepared for those, and they know that, that – that, Nothing's handed to them that they've had to earn it, and I think that's what we always are going to try to recruit in Indiana. Stay in the middle to Bill. Hey, Tom. Hi, Bill. Hey, uh, Bill Rogers, New York Times. As you talk to your uh, your brother-in-laws about you, you seem to re you're really into motivation and things like eye contact and all that. When you guys talk, what seems to be the difference between dealing with young men at, at this level and then dealing with guys at the next level? Is there a dramatic difference in the coach-player relationship between this level and that level? You know what? That's a great question that I don't think there's a huge difference. I think for two reasons. Number one, their league continues to get younger. It, you know, and both of them are, are building younger players into their program, you know, all the time and that are coming in as rookies and second-year players and, and having roles and then moving way up. So there's not a huge degree of separation with that. But I think, I think what those two have done and what I've continued to take from them is they don't come in with a business mindset. They don't treat their players like it's business. I mean, they, there's a business aspect to it, but they really do try to build one-on-one -on -one relationships. I mean, they really do try to get deep 
in the, in the sense of it's a lot more than just what we do from two to five or the eight o'clock quarterbacks meeting or the special teams meeting. And I, I think that's why those two are so successful because I don't think they've ever stopped coaching how they wanted to be coached, especially in the case of Jim, because I think Jim played, obviously played longer, so he played for enough guys that he knew what it was like to really have a relationship and a reverence to your coach, and he also knew what it was like to not have any relationship with your coach. And I think what he's done is taken the best of those worlds and put it forth. So that, to me, I mean, I, I still think, I, I look at the case of, of John and the guys that they coach, the Ray Lewises and Ed Reeds. There's an edge to, to all those guys that, that they love football. You know, I mean, they, they just... They're all different, but they love football, and their coaches love football. And I think that's what you're constantly trying to find in basketball. Is our common ground one where we just absolutely love this game and, and working at it and learning at it and doing things with it that will make us better. And, and I, I get inspiration from them on that. No matter how old their teams are, they, they still have a lot of that with them. I think we got time for two more. We'll still one right down here, and then we'll go in the middle. Ken Bykoff inside Indiana. Coach, the kids on these, this team from 10 wins to 12 wins to the Sweet 16 to outright champs this year, how has each one of those things prepared them for this moment? Mm, I don't know. It's a great question. I, I think it's all it's just a greater understanding all the time. You know, obviously you go through different experiences, and it, it's, it's how you feel from it. I mean, last year the Sweet 16 loss, it, you know, while, while common – Wisdom on the outside saying, they're going to be really good. They, they attacked Kentucky. They scored 90 points. They got all these guys coming back. Our guys went to work like it wasn't close to good enough. I think there's a big difference there. I think two years ago, or if, we didn't have a, if they didn't have a real desire to be successful, we wouldn't have had the spring and summer that we had. We had as good a spring and summer as I've ever been. A, one of the two, uh, two best I've ever been a part of as a coach, going back to a year at Marquette. But there's a real, real hunger. And no matter how young they were, no matter how old they were, there was a hunger that they could have done more. And I think that's what you always want. The, the, your, the vision of, of, of where you think you could go has always got to be a lot greater than the reality of where you're sitting. And that's where all your energy comes from. And if, you, if you're doing that, then you've got a real great chance to keep moving forward. And the last one will come right in the middle aisle, Coach. Coach Zach Kiefer with the Indy Star. Uh, sounds like Jordan and Will are both good to go tomorrow night. Knowing those two and their competitive level, you know, was there ever any doubt? Was there ever any, any issue with them two getting ready for this one? No, no, no. I, 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 we, we've seen nothing that would lead me to believe that we've got a game plan differently for this on tomorrow night. Not at all. Okay, Coach, thank all you. Right, Good thank luck. You. Thank you.